Um, First Corinthians, just, just kind of back up for a minute. How many of you remember last week we were talking chapter 5 and we were dealing with an issue of an immoral man in the church who had gotten involved with a woman who was married to his dad. Uh, it wasn't necessarily, I, from the way I read it, it wasn't his true mother, but it was his, his dad's wife from another marriage. And so he had gotten involved in a relationship that was uh, immoral, and the church was told to kick him out of the church uh, until he came to a census, and that was the way we would deal with that. Um, so basically what we're doing with tonight is still more issues within the church. How many of you know there are issues that come up? And so Paul knew this was going on in the church at Corinth. He had gotten these letters from Chloe's house, and he was in, in Ephesus, and he began to address these issues in these letters and, and trying to help them with some of the problems that they were having. And so tonight we're going to start out in verse 1 dealing with a dispute between a couple of brothers in the church. Um, we're talking about people that, uh, uh, that were Christians, that were having uh, disagreements on how uh, th they could settle their argument. And Paul, he gets really upset because apparently these individuals had taken this to the lawyers and taken it to the court system outside and began to air out the differences. And he said, this is not right because what's happening is you're brothers and sisters. It would be like uh, Kelvin and myself having an argument or a disagreement and couldn't come to a peaceful resolve, and he goes and hires a lawyer, and I hire a lawyer. We go before the judge, and we, we go to court and try to settle this thing as worldly people do. And, and Paul says that's not the way Christians should behave. He says Christians should behave different than that. They should work together to settle this and not air out their laundry in front of everybody else. How many of you know when I talk about when I say air out your laundry? You know, uh, I mean, we need to learn to behave. We need to learn how to act like Christians. And, and if it means being wronged, then be wronged. Uh, how many of you know sometimes you don't always have to be right? I heard two people say that's right. Let me try it again. Let me say this again. You don't always have to be right. Now, most of us like to be right. And we're going to prove our point, aren't we? Even if it means we're going to get the last word in. But I don't believe that's intended what God, God really intended for us as Christians to be like. I believe that we are to be humble. Come on, anybody understand? We're supposed to be submissive. We're supposed to be loving, compassionate, uh, forgiving. Come on. Uh, maybe I should just take you to another passage of Scripture for a minute and talk about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, mercy. How many of you know what I'm talking about here? You know, what does it say in 1 Corinthians 13 about love? Hmm. Love, uh, down around about the fifth or sixth verse says, hardly even notices when the other one does wrong. You know what? I found out I'm not that way most of the time. Instead of hardly noticing, I'm usually trying to point out their faults. <laughs> you didn't have to agree so loud. Come on. <laughs> we all do, don't we? My wife called me this afternoon, and she said, were you messing around in the, in the, in the cabinet down there next to the stove today? Uh and I said, no, I didn't mess it when I went home for lunch. All I did was I got something out of the refrigerator, put it on a plate, stuck it in the microwave, warmed it up, went and sat down in my recliner and ate my lunch and uh, put it all up there on the counter. She said, well, there's a mess in the kitchen. I said, well, I didn't mean to leave a mess. No, I, she said, there's a mess. Something has, there's a, glit, a dish that has fallen out of the cupboard and splattered all over the floor, glass everywhere. And, and I said, well, it wasn't like that when I left. I don't know. You might have to call my mama and ask her. She might have been. <laughs> I said, because it wasn't me. She said, well, I don't know what happened, but, you know, and, and how, we still don't know how it happened, but uh, one of her baking dishes, one of them nine by 13 pans, a glass dish, slid off inside the cabinet, opened the door, hit the tile, busted, and went all over. When I left after lunch, it wasn't nothing there, so. Uh, but it's funny how we all want to, did you do that? 
How many of you remember the the the, the cartoons uh, thing in the, in the papers, Family Circus? Uh, there there was always the question of who did this or who did that, and you ever notice it was not me? And they they finally named this ghost not me, not me did it. Okay, <laughs> and so. Uh, it was a not me that did it at the house today. We have no clue. The dog was in his, can't even blame it on the dog. He was in his room locked up. He wasn't the one that did it. Let's look at the word tonight. In first, verse 1, it says, If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before ungodly for the judgment instead of before the saints. Let's pray. Lord, I pray tonight that you would open our eyes, our ears, and our understanding that we might know you better. Lord, help us to understand from your word how we should apply these principles in our lives so that we can better serve you and better represent the kingdom of Christ. Have your way in our lives tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul says, you guys are disputing amongst each other. And, and, and I, I like the way he phrases this. Dare he take it before the ungodly? Why are you taking your problems before other people to air them out? Can't you resolve them on your own? You know, sometimes we, we have a difficulty between us, and uh, maybe it was a bad business transaction. Maybe it was a land dispute. Maybe Whatever it could have been, uh, it's important that we try to resolve that within ourselves rather than trying to take it to the courts and involve them. Matter of fact, in the day of Paul when he was there, um, the Roman government didn't really get into too much of the civil part of law with the Jewish church. Matter of fact, they let them handle it within the church. They had their own court system, and they would handle these issues. And so that's why Paul is addressing it this way. Today, uh, we in our society are very sue happy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, we, how many advertisements throughout the day are advertising for some lawyer firm, whether it's Farrah and Farrah or... Um, Morgan and Morgan or uh, I don't know who, Barnes, Barnes and Cohen or something. I mean, you know, and, and have you been involved in an accident? Don't, you know, don't wait too late. There's another one that says, don't wait too long. If you're over 14 days, you can I mean, they're trying to give you legal advice in these commercials, trying to get you to do this and do that. And if you've been unjustly treated, you know, uh, these guys are looking for your money. They're not really concerned about you. That's just the way they make their living. And so they like they like it when you come to them. Matter of fact, they'll suck you in there and say, hey, come on. And, and I won't charge you a dime unless I get something. Yeah, well, leave that one. They're going to get something all right before it's all said and done. Paul says, y'all need to take care of this. How much better it would be for us to resolve our issues between ourselves? Verse 2 says this, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Now, some of you said, well, pastor, you said last week in chapter 5 that we were not supposed to judge the world, but we're supposed to judge each other. How many of you heard me say that last week? I did, because that's what Paul said. But today he's saying you're, you're going to judge the world. Well, let me put you in a clear understanding here why there's such a contradiction to these two verses in two different chapters. In the last chapter, he was talking about we're to judge ourselves within the body of Christ. Some people say, well, we're not supposed to judge each other. No, Paul said you are to judge the body of Christ. We are to be accountable to one another for our actions, for our deeds, and we're to, we're to take judgment on each other and not judge the world because God's going to judge the world. He's the one that's going to do that. How else are we going to get them into the kingdom of God except for loving them? If all we do is going around and, and pointing our fingers at them. You know, last night I, I asked Donna when I got home, I said, you mind if I walk next door for a minute? My neighbors are over there. Well, these particular neighbors, I told you about some other neighbors the other day, but these particular neighbors uh, only live in that house uh, on occasions. They have a place in Fernandina. And uh, the wife has been going through some some physical uh, illnesses and some treatments and stuff. And I was a little concerned because they were staying over here a little bit more than normal. And I, I was 
afraid because she'd been doing chemo. I was, didn't know how things, and I wanted to just check on her. So I went off over there, and they were both sitting out there on the front porch, and I sat down with them on the porch for a minute, just find out how they were doing. And, and it, during our conversation, she's over there, and she has uh, her beer, you know, and he's had his. I could already smell it on him, you know, and he was smoking. And, and, but you know what? I never said a word to him about any of that because that's not my part to judge. My part's to love them and to draw them in. And when God gets a hold of them, God will do the clean. How many of you know we've got to get the fish in the boat first? And when you get the fish in the boat, then God does the cleaning. He'll take care of scaling the fish and getting them all ready so that they can be prepared to, to come into the kingdom of God. And so my, my time yesterday was spent on just befriending them because I don't get very often to see them. They come over maybe on a Friday night and a Saturday or Sunday. They're, they're headed back to Fernandina because they both work over there. And this is kind of their getaway little house from everything. And because she's sick, she's going to be there for a little while. So my goal had been through this whole campaign of Billy Graham, uh, Our Hope America, was to get with them. But they've never been around to really be with. And so I'm hoping that I can still touch their hearts and touch their lives and one day reach them for the kingdom of God so that they both are serving the Lord and, and living for him. You know, that's my, that's my desire. But here in the scripture it says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Well, what he's talking about in chapter 6 about judging the world is after the tribulation. He's talking about before the great white throne judgment. And so, if, you know, if you were to look in a couple different places in Matthew, he talks about how we will judge the world. Another place in Timothy, also in Revelation chapter 20, he talks about where there will be this revelation. We, we see there he talks about the judgment just before the great white throne judgment. Um, we will be sitting on thrones and, and we will be ruling with him. And so when we look at that, that's the kind of judgment that Paul's talking about. It's not a judgment of condemnation towards the people today, but because we were overcomers, they will, also, they will be judged and we won't be judged at that second judgment. Anyhow, the verse 2 goes on to say, and if you are judged, he says, the, excuse me, and, and if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge civil cases? How many of you have common sense? One, two, three, four, okay. Now, you can put your hands down. I'll, I'm going to ask this question, but I don't expect you to raise your hand. How many of you would say, I don't have any common sense? How many of you know somebody that doesn't have some common sense? <laughs> I knew that hand was going to go up. <laughs> Some people just don't have any idea, any clue. You know, there, there's all kinds of common sense. There's the kind that some guys can sit down. They don't even have to look at the directions to put something together. It's just common. It just falls into place. It's there. You know, um, it's obvious for common sense is something that's very obvious. You see the right and the wrong. You know, most of us have enough common sense for that. But there are some people that have no common sense. They just they just don't understand. And they don't have a clue. They're hard to judge, but almost everybody really does have enough common sense to judge between good and evil, between right and wrong. Amen? Now notice I said almost everybody. Almost. There are exceptions. There's some people that are missing a little, their elevator didn't go all the way to the top or, or something, you know, wh whatever you want to call it. But uh, Paul's trying to say, if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases within the body so that you don't have to take them to court? He said, let's not throw our business out there for the world. How, what kind of Christian is that? I mean, you know, when they, you know, when you hear about these big suits going on and they advertise it in the news and they tell everybody's business, you know, is that good business for the church? No, I don't think that's a good name for the Lord. You know, I, I'm going to say something here, and I hope you don't take this wrong, but uh, this this individual that is trying to burn the Korans, 
How many of you have seen that on the news? The, the pastor down, he was in, in the Gainesville area, and then he moved farther south to Lakeland area, and uh, he tried to burn all the Korans. He was against, you know, the Muslims and all, and so he was trying to do that. Well, here a few months ago, he was planning to do it again, and he had taken and gotten a bunch of Korans, put them in a charcoal grill, uh, and it pulls behind his, his, in a trailer behind his vehicle, well, he had already soaked those things with kerosene, and somebody found out and told on him, and they stopped him along the way. And because he was transporting fuel now illegally, they were able to stop him. And his business has been in the, ma in the news continually. Let me tell you what, that's a bad name for the kingdom of God. You, you know, that's just not a good representation for God's people. You know, uh, the Koran is maybe it's not something that we agree with, but I don't think that we need to be out there causing the Lord Jesus Christ. To, you know, if you're doing this in the name of Jesus, I don't think that's something that Jesus would have done. Can I, amen? I think Jesus would have handled it in a different air, a different way. And I want to go back to the wristband that says, what would Jesus do? WWJD. What would he do? How would he handle this? Let me ask you, when you're going through these arguments with other Christians, how would Jesus have handled this situation? And I think that's what Paul was trying to get across here in this text was we need to be careful how we do this. And, he, and he's talking about if you're competent to judge, you know, and, and judge the world, certainly you're able to, to judge these trivial cases. Verse 3 goes on to say, do you not know that we will also judge angels? Again, he's talking about at the end of times, the angels will be judged. Matter of fact, in chapter 6, or not chapter 6, but verse 6 in Jude, uh, I want to read this to you, Jude 6, it says, And the angels who did not keep their positions in authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment, on that great day, they're going to be judged one day. They will be before everything is put into order. How many of you understand there's going to be a great judgment day? A judgment day is coming. So in saying all that, the rest of verse 3 then would say, how much more the things of this life? If we're going to judge angels, shouldn't we have to judge the things of this life that are going on? Therefore, he says, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. Now, I don't know about you, but when I thought about that, men of little account, <laughs> what does that mean? Well, maybe he wasn't the pastor. Maybe he wasn't a board member. Maybe he's not even a Sunday school teacher. When I think of a little account, meaning he did not necessarily have a position of authority within the church, but even a man of no account, meaning no authority, could also judge in some of these simple matters that are causing conflict that people are going to the courts. Now, you've got to remember, we're in the city of Corinth. We're talking about the problems they were having they were ungodly people from the very start, uh, had no sense of moral value, and Paul's been trying to put it into them and to train them and develop them into men and women of God. So he says in verse 5, I say this to shame you, for it is, is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? Certainly there is in the church. Let's make sure we settle our situations without going to court against each other. Let's resolve the issue. So if you have a problem, find a Christian brother in the church. Say, look, would you help us to help us resolve this thing? Let's get this thing settled. <clears throat> Verse 6 says, but instead one brother goes to, a law, goes to law against another and is front, in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have become or you you have been completely defeated already. You're not living like Christians. You're living like worldly men. Basically what he's you're not li How many of you know that we we're supposed to follow Christ? 
A lot of times our attitude is, I'm going to do this the way the world does it. I'm going to go to court. I'm going to take you to court. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Uh, you know, wait a minute. Love, if I remember right, in chapter 13 of Corinthians, love does not demand its own way. Let me say it again. Love does not demand its own way. How many of you love your brother? If you love him, if you love him, are you going to demand your own way? Or would you rather be wrong? Look at this word. Look at the word here. He says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have com been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Somebody help me out. What does it mean to be wronged? What? Turn the other cheek. No way. Come on. What does it mean to be wrong? Felt like you've been taken advantage of, huh? Anybody here ever been taken advantage of? And, and did you feel like you needed to get even? It happens every day. Remember, those of you that were here, we probably need to go back and do this series again. But uh, John Bevere did the series on the bait of Satan. And he talks about picking up the bait. When somebody offends us and we have to get back, that's taking the bait. Satan laid the snare. He's laid a trap for you. And when they offend you, they do something that hurts you or, or they've said something that you didn't like or they've mistreated you or they did something unfair to you and you take the bait Guess what? You give the enemy an opportunity to step in and cause division within the brethren. Look at what Paul says one more time here in this verse. He says, why not rather be wronged? Why not let them just go ahead and have their way? Somebody give me a good excuse why we shouldn't. Why? <laughs> well, they're not your enemy. That's your brother. <laughs> you gotta look. He, became, he became my enemy all of a sudden, huh? How many of you know that that's, it, it's those that, that are closest to us that hurt us the worst? Those that are the closest to us are the ones that hurt us the worst. And not intentionally. Most of the time, it was never intended to hurt you. Amen? But sometimes we just say things and and. You can't take it back, can you? Have you ever tried to get them words back? They don't come back, man. It doesn't hit the ears. It's already taken root. Then people's like, nah, nah I ain't trusting you no more. You blew it. How many of you know what the most unruly part of your body is? That thing right there is deadly, like a poison. It's like a wildfire, James says. It, it, it can set the woods on fire, amen? It can cause all kinds of evil, deadly things to happen. And, and so he says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? I'll share with you a story, and some of you have heard this. You've been here long enough. You've heard it before. But years ago when I was working after college, I was working part-time at the church and full-time for one of the board members of the church uh, down in West Palm Beach. And after had been there a while, he made me a salesman. And he, he promised me he would give me one half of 1% of my total gross sales. That don't sound like a whole lot, one half of 1%. But one half of 1% of a half a million dollars comes out to be a pretty good chunk of change. And that was a bonus above my salary. Well, he owed me that money and never paid me. 
And he owed me that money and never paid me. And I watched him go out to eat every week. And I watched him buy this and that for his hunting club and for his hunting buggy and for his this, that, and the other thing, spending the money. And I kept wondering, when is he going to pay me? When is he going to take care of me? When is he going to? Anybody know what a feeling? I mean, I just, we're talking several thousand dollars. And I was, <clears throat> I was struggling with this because I felt like I, I needed to be compensated. I, I needed it financially. We were in a difficult place. And I happened to be in the, in the church at the time I was sitting on the platform there. Praise and worship was going. There was a little bench over on this side. And he was out over here on this side. And everybody was raising their hands. And, and I looked out there, and, buddy, he had his hands up. He was praising God, just worshiping the Lord, having a great time. And, and all of a sudden, a thought came into my mind. He needs to pay me. And it began to eat on me. How can he worship God when he knows he has a debt that he hasn't paid? And I was struggling with that. And this went on a couple of day, a couple of times. And finally, one Sunday morning, I was sitting up there. I couldn't even enter into worship. I, it was just eating me up. It was my problem, not his. It was mine. And I walked out off the platform during the praise and worship. And I walked up to him. I said, look, I said, I need to talk to you. And I carried him out to the foyer. And I, and I called him by name. And I said, look, I said, I, you know, I don't work for you anymore. A church had put me on full time. I guess he thought he didn't know me. I don't know what the thing was. But I just told him, I said, look, I said, here's the, my sheet of my commissions of what should have been given me. This is the total. I said, I'm giving it to you. Your debt is paid in full. You don't owe me a dime. And I asked him to forgive me for harboring those feelings against him. And he looked at me and he says, okay. <laughs> Went back in, praising God, and I'm looking at him like, you don't know how bad that bothered me. I'm trying, I, I want to do it, but he didn't say, okay, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry we didn't take care of you or not, you know, just no, no, con, no concern. But I watched and, and the devil just still tried to work on me. But I had already voiced my comment, I forgive you, and I release you from this. And the moment I finally did, that same morning, I did that morning, I finally released it. I let go of it. There was a peace that came over me that I could enter into worship. I didn't let that thing become a hindrance any longer. And I could look at him, and I could hug his neck, and I could love on him. Because I had released it. I had let go. Did that mean those feelings ever left? No, there were times that would, the old devil, how many of you know the old devil likes to remind you of stuff? But I have to keep telling the devil, shut up. Shut up. I've already released him of that. It's gone. I want you to know, I believe God has rewarded me over and over and over again for letting go. When you hold on to something, it will tear you up worse than it teared. The, he had no idea I was holding on to those feelings. What well, bothering him a bit? How many of you hear what I'm saying tonight? If you're holding on to something you better let go of it or it'll eat you alive. Okay? It will tear you up and you'll be miserable. Paul is trying to tell us here in this principle. He says, instead, he said, you know, why do you continue doing this? I lost my place. Seven, yeah. Why not rather be wronged? Why not better, rather be cheated? Let go of it. Instead, you yourself cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your own brothers. Church, Paul's trying to lay a principle here. Let go of things. Don't hold these things against each other. 
I've had opportunity to share that story with individuals from time to time that were having problems. And I just told them, you know, not just in a sanctuary like this, but individually, and sit down with them and say, look, let me tell you, if you're holding this against somebody, you need to let go. Mine was, was this amount. Yours might be more or less. It doesn't matter. It's the same principle. It's the same principle. You have to let go of it. If you don't, it will eat you alive. It will hold you up. Why not rather be wronged? Anyhow, verse 9 says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? How many of you knew that? Let me say it again. The wicked. The wi- Who's the wicked? Is that, is that witch in, in the, the yellow brick road, right? The wicked witch of the West, right? Where's the ruby red slippers? No. The wicked, the wicked, the evil, the vile. Listen to this. He says in verse 9, Do not be deceived, neither the sexual and moral, which he was dealing with them continually in the city of Corinth, the sexually immoral, the idolaters. Let's talk about the idolaters for a minute. What are the idolaters? What's that, Betty? Worship. Yeah, but what are idols? I mean, y'all don't have idols in your house. Anything we put before God. Somebody, Nate, what was some of the things we can put before God? Oh, I hear TV, food. What? iPads, food, TV. Facebook, come on, what? Cars. Money. People. False worship. That means if you put those things first, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Is that right? I got another one. How about hunting? Whoops. About fishing? Whoops. What about sports of any kind? Whoops. What about shopping? Whoops. <laughs> huh? If it gets in place of God, if it becomes a, a something we prefer and we put it before God, it becomes an idol. We've got to be very careful. Let's move on. Neither the sexual and moral, the idolaters, the adulterers. How many of you know we know what adulterers are? Adulterers are those that are fooling around, right? Look at the next one. Male prostitutes. He was talking to the men first here. He gets the women later. But male prostitutes. Then he says, nor the homosexual offenders. I still have a problem with this. How some people can claim that they can be homosexual and still worship God. That's that's exactly what I'm saying. Yep. You either are or you aren't. God did not create us to be homosexuals. Can God save homosexuals? Absolutely. Should we minister to homosexuals? Absolutely. Just as you would an alcoholic or a druggie or anybody else. They are worthy of being redeemed. Hello. But in that present lifestyle, it should not be accepted within the church to be a member, a part of the body of Christ, okay? They'll not make the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying here. Those who, he said, instead yourself cheat and do wrong, he says, do you not think that the the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? So homosexual offenders, nor thieves. Mm, This next one might get a hold of a bunch of us. 
nor the greedy. Ain't nobody in here greedy, is there? <laughs> Anybody ever face that little greed once in a while? Come on, that spirit just jump, wants to jump on us sometime, wants to. We just, man, I wish I had, you know, or I wish I could. I wish, we, 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 we. He says, nor the drunkards. Hopefully there's none of you here tonight. Nor the slanderers. Hopefully there's none of you tonight that slander other people and their personality and their character. And Nor the swindlers. What's a swindler? Somebody that takes advantage of somebody else? Cheater? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11 says, and that is what some of you were. He says, but you were washed. How many of you have been washed by the blood? Come on. You were washed. You were sanctified, meaning you were set apart. Anybody here been set apart by the kingdom of God for his glory? He says, you were washed, you were sanctified, and were justified. The name justified means you were, justification means just as if you had never sinned. Keep that in mind. You were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. How many of you are thankful for that tonight? He says then, if that being so, Paul says, everything is permissible for me, but everything is, but not everything is beneficial. What he's saying is, I'm, I'm free. As, as born again, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not bound by the law, so everything's been, anything's free. I can do it, but it's not all beneficial. How many of you know you can go do what you want to, but it's not always beneficial? It's not always good for you. Look at the next phrase. He says, everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. How many of you know if you become mastered by something, you become a slave to it? If it's some type of an addiction in your life, we become a slave. And we've got to be careful that we don't allow things to enslave us to them. He says in verse 13, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. What Paul's trying to do is take an analogy from his day and talking about how the food, you know, anything that we put into us, the food we take in doesn't defile us, okay? He says food for the stomach and stomach for the food, but God will destroy them both, meaning none of them have any value of our Christian walk. And then the next thing he says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. How many of you know that this body doesn't belong to you if you've been washed in the blood? This body doesn't belong to you anymore. You can't live like you want to anymore because it's not yours. How many of you know what happened when you gave your heart to Jesus? You died. How many of you know dead men don't get their way anymore, do they? How many of you heard that? Dead men don't get their way. If you really died to Christ, it's not your way anymore. It's what Christ wants. Amen? So here he says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. How many of you are thankful you're going to be raised? Amen. Amen. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? When you got saved, this body belonged to the body of Christ. Shall I then take a member of Christ and unite it with a prostitute? Shall I introduce this spiritual body that God gave me into a life of prostitution or with a prostitute or with sexual immorality or into some kind of debauchery or alcoholism or drugs or whatever? Should I take what belongs to Christ and mess it up again? No. God forbid. Never. Verse 16 says, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? 
For it is said, the two will become one flesh. How many of you know when, when a man and a woman have sexual relationships, there's a potential there's going to be a baby born? Hello? Two become one. One flesh. They are bound together. You can't take something that belongs to God and mix it with sin. God will not mix with sin. He doesn't have anything to do with it. He says here, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So flee from sexual immorality. All other sins of a man commits outside of his body, but the one who sins sexually sins against his own body. Your body's not your own. It belongs to God if you've been washed in the blood. Verse 19 says this, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Anybody Understand, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God resides inside of you now. It's not you. It's God living in you. Who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought and paid for with a price. Think about that price that you were paid for. What was that? What, was that? what did it cost for your salvation? What was it, Mamie? Jesus' life, his blood was demanded for our salvation. God gave his very best so that you and I might have life everlasting. How many of you know he paid the ultimate price? He paid the most that could ever be paid, more than any dollar could ever amount to. He closes by saying in verse 6, or chapter 6 in this last verse, Therefore, honor God with your body. Tonight, as we close, I want you to stand with me, and I want you to realize that your body is not your own. You don't have the authority to do what you want to. Oh, yes, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial, Paul said. Everything is permissible, but he says, I'll not let myself be a slave or anything be master over me. How many of you want to take control back over your life and not let the enemy have control in our thoughts and our attitudes? Rather to be wronged, rather to be taken advantage of than to get our own way. Lord, tonight, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. Lord, I pray that the principles that we have heard from your word will resound deep within us and so that, God, when we are faced with challenges each day, that, God, we'll be able to stand firm on our convictions from what your word says and that, Lord, we'll be able to act and respond as godly men and women and that our light will shine in this dark world so that others might see Christ living in us. Lord, remove the flesh, remove the worldliness, remove the things that don't belong in us so that we might serve you better, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. God bless you. Hope you got something tonight. Amen.